from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, 100 miles. And uh, Mary was pregnant and was about ready to deliver Jesus. That's a long way to travel. So she's nine months pregnant. And uh, Caesar Augustus issues this decree and says by dogma that everyone is to travel back to their hometown to register so that uh, taxation could be levied accurately on these provinces outside of Rome. So he wanted a census taken. He wanted to know how many people lived in this place and that place, one place and another place, and they would be apportioned a part of the Roman budget and uh, said, you'll be required to collect this much money to support this legion or this building project or whatever it is that Caesar Augustus wanted to do in a given year. So a hundred miles north to south. So the family's up. That takes five days, six days, seven days, eight days. I'm not sure. 20 miles a day in five days, that'd be a rapid rate for a pregnant woman and a man to travel. Maybe it took two weeks. We're not exactly sure how long it took, but They moved the 100 miles to the south, and uh, there's no room for them, but they find a place in a stable, in a cave, 
And that's where Jesus is born. Now, Luke chapter 2 is the best known of the Christmas stories. And it's the story that we read earlier in church. And uh, there's a theme that I want you to consider in Luke chapter 2. And it's a question that's pertinent even today in our lives as we live in the world that we encounter daily uh, today. And the question that is before us in this chapter and that we face on a daily basis is the question, who's in charge? Who really is in charge? And uh, there are two different people that you could make a case that Caesar Augustus is in charge. He's the one who gives this decree, and it's worldwide. He tells every person to go back to their hometown to register to be taxed. So Caesar's very powerful, and I want to say a few things about him in just a moment. Is it Caesar who is in charge, or is it God who's in charge of all these events? And the Bible's going to contend, of course, that God is in charge. But Caesar certainly thinks that he's in charge. He was a very important person, Caesar was. He was the first governor, the first emperor of Rome. He lived from 63 B.C. to 14 A.D. He ruled for 50 years or so as emperor in Rome. And he was very effective in things that he accomplished. In fact, historians say that Caesar Augustus brought three great things to the world. And I want to show you what they are on the screen. Maybe you've heard these ideas before. There's the Pax Romana, the Lex Romana, and the Via Romana. This is what Caesar, Augusta, uh, Caesar Augustus has contributed to world history, the peace of Rome. He brought peace to the world. 200 years of peace. You can hardly go back in history and find a period in history where a ruler ruled for, uh, or a civilization extended its power for 200 years and there was peace in the world. Caesar Augustus brought 200 years of peace to the world. He brought the Lex Romana, the law, Roman law. Our jurisprudence today is still based on Roman law. He was very important. He built roads the Via Romana. You can go to Italy today and walk down roads still that Caesar Augustus built. So he was a very important person. And because he was so important, he claimed certain titles for himself. His name was Gaius Octavius. That was his name. His given name was Gaius Octavius. But he was reared by his grandmother. And his grandmother was named Julia. And she was related to Julius Caesar. And when Caesar became so prominent, Augustus took Caesar's last name. So though he was named Gaius Octavius, he took the name Caesar. He also took a title, Divi Filius. That means son of of God. He declared himself to be Divi Filius, the Son of God. So one of the questions this chapter asks is, who really is the Son of God? Is it Caesar Augustus? Or is it Jesus the Christ? Who is the true Son of God? Caesar Augustus says, I'm the man in charge. I'm the man who's powerful. I am Divi Filius. That's how he proclaimed himself, the Son of God. He was the imperator, the emperor. He claimed that he was sovereign over the entire world. Who's in charge here? Caesar or Jesus? And he called himself Augustus, the splendid one, the majestic one. Just call me Augustus, he said. Not Gus like in Lonesome Dove, Augustus. Augustus, the majestic one. Those were his titles. Gaius Octavius, his name. He was Caesar, Divi Filius, Imperator, and Augustus. Now, 
Luke chapter 2 is asking a question, and I want us to get the answer right. Who's really in charge here? Who's in charge of the world? Is it the governmental leader who's in charge of the world? Is our president in charge of the world? Is the leader in Russia in charge of the world? Is the leader in China in charge of the world? Who, who's really in charge here? And the great news of the Bible is that Jesus is in charge. And this little baby born in a manger is more powerful than Divi Phileas. That's one of the stories that this chapter teaches us. Now I want you to notice a few things in this story in Luke chapter 2. They come to Bethlehem. They take this long journey. Maybe they are late arriving. We don't know how large Bethlehem was at the time that uh, Jesus was born, but maybe a population of 200, 300, 400 people, not a large place. Not many Motel 6s in uh, Bethlehem back then, and they were late arriving. There was no place to stay, and they had to stay out back in a cave. The manger where Jesus was born was in a cave, and uh, there was a little trough there, like you can see here, and Jesus was wrapped in cloths and placed in the trough, and then there's that statement, because there was no room for them in the inn. And that statement has become very important down through the years of Christian history. There was no room for them in the inn. At the birth of Jesus, and throughout the life of Jesus, and still today, for many people, there's no room for Jesus. There's no room. I'm too busy, I have my own agendas, I have my own life to live, I have my own family, I have my own program, I don't have any room in my life for Jesus. One of the sad things that Christians note every Christmas season is that there's room made for nearly everything during Christmas except for Jesus. Jesus has become almost inconsequential to Christmas. Is that not a sad thing? You can have Christmas without Jesus. And in fact, nearly everyone, or most people certainly, even in this country, have Christmas with very little regard for Jesus. So one of the questions we ought to ask ourselves when we read this story about the birth of Jesus is, do I have room in my life for Jesus? Do I have room for him? Does he lead my thinking? Does he lead my agenda? When I live my day, am I concerned about whether I am living in such a way as to please Jesus or not? Or does Jesus have very little place in my life whatsoever? So there's that idea. Then there's this concept also in Luke chapter 2 of the shepherds in the field and the angel appearing to the shepherds. The angel appears to the shepherds and the glory of the Lord shines around the angels. The angels, you could say, were august. They were august. So there's this point again. Who really is Augustus? Is Augustus the magnificent one, Caesar, or is this little baby with the angels that sing praises about him, is the baby the august one? To the shepherds in the field, the angels come. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. A Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. He's the Savior. He's Christ he is the Lord. It's not Caesar Augustus who's the Lord. It's the baby who is the Lord. He is the Savior. So you find here in the way we have decorated our church this Christmas, this contrast between the baby and the cross. The baby and the cross. 
And that's deliberate. That's theological. There's a reason that Our Ladies decorated the sanctuary as they decorated the sanctuary. You see on the Christmas trees all the lights and one of the themes of Christmas is that into the darkness of this world, light has come. So Christmas lights reflect the light that Jesus brings into the darkness of our troubled age. But here in the center of the sanctuary, you see the baby Jesus, and behind the baby Jesus is the cross. Now that's thematic. There's a reason they decorated the church as they decorated it. They're making a statement in the way they have arranged this that the very purpose of the coming, the coming of this baby is to die on that cross. The baby was born with a mission. The baby was born with a purpose. The baby, that pretty little baby, came to die a cruel death on that instrument of death, the Roman cross. So it was announced at the, birth of Jesus, at the birth of Jesus, He is Christ the Lord, but He is our Savior, one come to die. The angels sing, in the heavens, glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace to men, on whom His favor rests. Peace. Every Jew in the ancient world, while walking down a road, who would meet a fellow Jew, would give a greeting to that fellow Jew. One Jew would say to another Jew in meeting him, Shalom. Shalom, my brother. Shalom, my sister. So if you were to go to breakfast and you saw some of your friends and you wanted to greet them, you wouldn't say, uh, Guten Morgen, or you wouldn't say, Buenos Dias, or you wouldn't even say, Good morning. You would say, Shalom, my brother, or Shalom, my sister. Peace, peace. The customary, Jew, or the customary greeting for one Jew to another was the greeting of peace, peace be to you. It was a very common word. It was a word everyone knew. So when Jesus comes, the angels come and they sing on earth, peace, peace. Now that has to do with man's relationship with God. Peace between sinful men and a holy God. Because this little baby came to die on that cruel cross to establish and to render the world at peace with God. Now, the story concludes with Mary thinking about the birth of her son. It says in verse 19 that she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary stood at the cross when Jesus was dying on the cross, Mary was there. And Jesus spoke to her. He said, Mary, behold your son. Behold your son, Mary. You've been thinking about me. You've been pondering me. You've been considering me all these years. Here's who I am, Mary. Mary. I am the sacrifice for sin. Here's why I came, Mary. I came to die on the cross for sinners. She pondered. No one thought more about Jesus than did Mary. She thought about him day and night. She considered him. She asked questions about who he was. What was he to do? What was the nature of his humanity? He was born in such a miraculous way. And he came in order to to die. So Luke chapter 2 is the great Christmas story. It's the story that we are most familiar with. The story of Joseph and Mary going this 100 miles from Nazareth in the north down to Bethlehem in the south, about 8 miles south of Jerusalem where Jesus could be born. When we read it we ask and we answer certain questions. 
Who's the august one? It's Jesus. Who's the real imperator? The one in charge of all things? It's Jesus. Who's the divi filius? The Son of God. It's Jesus. It's not Augustus Caesar that we remember. It's Jesus the Christ our Lord that we remember. We bow down and we worship him. We'll pray together. Father, we thank you for the day you've given. We thank you, Lord, for this time of the year, for the Christmas season. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that this baby born in the manger died on the cross to save us from our sins. Help us to worship him as such, to know him as such, put our faith in him as such. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and bless us through these Christmas days that lie ahead this coming week. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing together a hymn of commitment and invitation. So, Susan, you come and lead us if you would.